Welcome, listeners. Episode 30, Ben. 30? 30. It's mental. Incredible. I know. Madness. Three times ten. <laughs> Is it? Just thought I'd throw that in there. Yeah? Don't, don't question my maths. <laughs> Not again. <laughs> Right, good evening everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're excited that you all are hopefully listening. Um, and I'm excited to be chatting to Ben. Um Nope. I was hoping he was gonna say something, but that's where he is. So <laughs> anyway, this evening <laughs> on the hobby desk. So we've both been quite busy again, um, doing plenty of bits and bobs to talk about, and also a further update to our weather in chat. Um, into the galaxy of war. So I have been exploring the underhive. Uh, and enjoying a bit of Necromunda and uh, Rogue Trader is on the way um, we've got a price confirmed now for that and uh, the content so that's really exciting to talk about Canis Rex the Night Preceptor character is on the way so I want to have a chat about him because he looks badass um, yeah that's about it <laughs> and... <laughs> Yes, Ben has read his Space Wolf Codex, so um, I'm sure we will hear all about those as well. In the Mortal Realms, the Beastmen are returning. Night Vault has been uh, announced, and we are going to have a chat about Chaos. Um, No guesses, uh, sorry, no guesses, no prizes for guessing who decided on that subject. (laughs) Um, Going into the community, our usual shout-outs, a little look at the calendar, and then finally into the wilds where we've got Test of Honor. Um, Ben's dabbling a bit in some historical stuff. And I'm going to be chatting unsurprisingly about Middle Earth and my continuing journeys through that awesome realm. So there we are. Anything else, Ben? Nope, I think that's pretty much covered it. I think that's it all. Guys, you know what to do. Oh, in fact, I will share that. An, an absolute legend sent me a meme that he'd done, and it was uh, corn demands that you grab some refreshments, and I, I, it was brilliant. So, there you go. Grab those refreshments. Join us on the hobby desk. Hi guys, and welcome to our hobby desk, our thirtieth hobby desk. Well, Amazing. actually, it's kind of like thirty-first, I think, because you've recorded a video one. I have, yes. And now, yep. I what I want to know is how is Joe coping with the sort of hordes of screaming women now that your face is out there on social media, or men? <sighs> yeah. It's like that Lynx advert, to be honest, isn't it? Where the dude's on the beach with two cans of Lynx Africa. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I have. I saw that in the news. <laughs> the streets of Bodmin have been likened to a a, a beach paradise. Zombie apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll move in swiftly on from that. Um, yeah, I enjoyed doing that, dude, actually. I really did. Um, it just seemed a nice way of, of going through stuff because the Titanic of scenery is quite difficult to get across all that cool nuance, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. You know, without... So I thought a video would probably be the, the best way to do that. And um, I think it I think it worked. I mean, we've got a long way to go before, you know, our videos are any decent quality. We're but, not um, quite at Peter Jackson, Lord of the Rings level yet, but... Uh, no. You never know. To be honest, um, actually the mobile phone worked quite well to do all the zooming stuff. To be, so... We got, you know, it was able to get quite up nice and close, but it, you know, it is what it is. Um, so what have you been working on, dude? Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm just recalling then. I, I have been doing, uh, more Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I was away with the fairies then thinking about video equipment. Um, so, uh, I have been working on more Lord of the Rings which will have come of no surprise. So I actually managed, and I I can't believe this, I finished the uh, Bolt Thrower and Shaman, which was my last bits I had to do. Um, and I told myself I was not allowed to buy any more Lord of the Rings stuff until they were done. And uh, Yeah, and, I mean, and I did that's it. quite sensible, isn't it? Well, 
so I've been getting, I am, I'm totally overwhelmed by loads of stuff. Um, but I've got a few things on the go, like, um, Titanicus, Lord of the Rings, um, Necromunda, where I haven't got loads of stuff for those things. So it's easier to sort of say, right, well, let's start in a good place and not buy more. Um, yeah. the funny thing was though, <laughs> it was like floodgates. So, as soon as I'd finished those models, I pre-ordered the new rules. <laughs> and then, within two days, I bought two boxes of Warg Riders, when I was only supposed to be getting one. And 24 more Orcs, three more uruk because I managed to get the other three sculpts, and the new Banner guy. And then I sat down to watch The Lord of the Rings... And I was so excited. I pre, I, I pre ordered. I ordered Bilbo Baggins as well, <laughs> <laughs> like the one where he stood looking at the ring in his hand. Oh, that's a nice model. Yeah, that. it's lovely. So, so yeah, the floodgates sort of opened, uh, driven yeah. also by like our desire to, to my desire, sorry, to have a big Mordor orc army, so me and you can play the big game that you know was dreamt of years ago. Um, yeah, and there's rules for that in the new book, there which are, is so yeah. exciting. Yeah, um, yeah. Apart from, I've I have realised I don't have any of the men and numeral, so that's going to take. Some, you know, we are totally off of the hobby desk here. This is. <laughs> yeah, well, you took it there. We can talk about that a bit I, I more do. in the um in the wilds. But I bought I've bought two lots of of wild riders, so I've started building those um slowly. I'm going to build two without riders because in Lord of the Rings um, like the rider can be shot off and a warg yeah. because it's got uh, an attacks characteristic and a courage characteristic that isn't naught it can stick around if its rider gets shot off so like a horse yeah. will run away automatically yeah. so you remove the whole model um and obviously I've got orcs to represent if the warg gets shot um and I don't you know it, uh, yeah that's fine so I'm happy with that um I'm going to do that I've also been working. Why? Why don't you magnetize it? But because I can't be faffing with that. For the case of two wags, I don't okay. want a little bit because I'll lose the bit of fur that goes on in place of the magnetized orc. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's only a tiny little bit of fur, um, and also by the time I haven't double checked all the heroic tears, but. There is a reason, but we should come to it later. Because <laughs> otherwise I'm going to get into... I'm going to talk about all of the stuff to do with Lord of the Rings before we get further on. Um, <laughs> so I've also been working on some sort of homebrew scenery stuff. So I've been making some plinths for my buildings, uh, or my buildings and Ben the Bass's buildings, which Harriet thinks yeah. is hilarious because he's Ben the Bass and I'm making the bases for them. Um Oh, yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, see, well pointed out. So I've built three. Um, they're taking a little bit of time. Uh, it's all like plaster card and, but it's, it looks, it does really give the building some more presence. Um, yeah, it definitely does. So I'm hoping to crack on with those, uh, Wednesday, Thursday this week because Ben is being much more disciplined than me. Um, he really wants to get Rohan. And start his Rohan army, and he won't do it until we've done all this Adeptus Titanicus stuff. Um, yeah. And the sort of thing that spurs me on is we're splitting Pelennor Fields, but he won't buy Pelennor Fields until and, he's done yeah. all that stuff. And Pelennor Fields has got the troll, the Witch King in it, which is the two. Like, I'm really looking forward to painting a troll. Really, really excited to paint a troll. But I'm not going to get one until we get that done. So he's a superb model. I think I, I think I painted either him or the or the last one they did in metal. Um, was one of the last models I did for Games Workshop, or one of the last? Yeah. Well, I need two anyway for our game. Um, yeah. And the nice thing at the moment is you can pick up trolls for like fifteen quid because people have bought the big box and have split. It. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, like, you know, if you are trying to... Going back to what I said about my budgeting, so I bought some Mordor Orcs online. I try and spread it out. So, like, I bought... I ordered... 
I ordered the books and the dice from Games Workshop um because I had some vouchers as well and then I went to gym and bought my wag riders and then I went on to eBay and picked up a couple bits you can't get anymore like the three sculpts and also 24 Mordor orcs for like a tenner so you know just try and spread it around a bit spread the love when there's so many awesome places that sell hobby and all of the guys are great <laughs> yeah it's it's hard to yeah I know exactly what you mean hmm that's an awesome loaded deal. I, I really love the prints. I think they're I think they're excellent. Yeah, well, excellent. somebody keeps saying I should do a little guide. Um, uh, who? I, can, I, I don't know. Who would, who would say it such an inspired and wise thing? It could be the person is quite <laughs> prolific with doing interesting stuff for people. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so, so that's me, a fairly busy hobby desk, hoping to... I've had a couple of days lull. Hoping to crank it. Oh, hang on. I completely forgot. I was working on some Stormcast as well. Um, so Dan Wosley wants to do the Knights Excelsior, I think they're called. Um, they're the white ones that are like really hate chaos. So like they're, they're just not having any of it. Um, and so I was working with him to try and come up with a, a fairly uh, speedy, sensible way to do them. Um, we started out trying black undercoat and then like a, a xenophil white, um, quite yeah. heavy xenophil white. But the problem that I found with that or that we found with that is when Dan was going in and adding the other colours, painting over white is a bit of a faff. Um, you have to use very thin coats and then you end up using more coats. Um, so... What I then did was I tried, I did a solid Corax white over the whole model, then washed the whole model with a 50-50 mix of sapia and lamium medium. Um, mm -hmm. And what that's done is it's created a base coat that comfortably takes darker colours without taking too many, like it literally only takes a couple of coats to get the base coat solid. But also it gives a really nice base for a ceramic-y white armour and the bone um, tabards and stuff, which obviously you are aware there are loads of on the sec sequitors. Ridiculous. Yeah. So, yeah, so I've been doing that as well. So now, what have you been doing? <laughs> well, bone tabards on a bunch of sequitors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is essentially what I feel like I've been doing for two weeks. Um so I think I think, I think that's I've, because you made... have been doing that for two weeks. So there's been a load of lessons learnt with these, really. So I um, where to start? So I think first of all, I got lulled into a false sense of security with the um, with the night horn. I can paint the night horn at a speed that it doesn't even really feel like I've put in any effort. Um. That's that's because of the techniques that I'm using on them, and the fact that the models they they are so easy to paint quickly. Um, so I I kind of thought, oh, I do you know what I I could do the whole all of the stormcast all at once. So I I did, <laughs> and um, and that was mistake number one because normally I break them down into like their units, do a unit, move on to the next one. Mistake number two, I didn't do a test model, and I really should have done this. So for my Normal Stormcast, I base coat the whole model in Balthazar Gold, wash it in Agrax Earthshade, and then you know build the armour up, and then just pick out all the other details, and it takes me no time at all. I mean, a lot less time than, almost about the same time as the Nighthorn, which is, I suppose, why I was lulled into a full sense of security. But with these guys, because there was so much cloak, I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll base coat them in grey, and then I'll, I'll airbrush the cloaks in Rakarth, and then Pallid Witch Flesh Zenith them. Mm. And um, and then pick out the gold and, and do it that way. What ended up happening is, because the gold is deeper, I ended up getting so much stuff on all of the white that it was almost... It took me ages to do, and it was a waste of time. Yeah, I was just... If that makes sense. Just thinking, actually, myself, that I suspect the problem you had was that... um. The gold is deeper. So then what I ended up having to do is once I'd finished the gold, I ended up having to block out 
all of the fabric in, in Rakath again. And, and that would just, so basically I'd wasted an, a whole step. I should have, I should have base coated them all in Balthazar gold and blocked out the Rakath. And that would have taken hours, literally hours off of my time. Mm. Um, the next thing I did wrong was I treated the cloaks in the same way as I treated the shield and the shoulder pads, which I did in a very specific way because I've, I've been trying to match the colours on my on the first ones I did, and I know how I did the first ones, and it's a bit complicated, and it, it was working up from Rakarth through um, Pallid Witch Flesh and then a bit of white, but, but essentially Rakarth, 50-50 Pallid Witch Flesh, Rakarth, and then Pallid Witch Flesh, and then wash it with Sepia, and then work it back up with Ushabti, Screaming Skull, and then white. Which sounds really complicated, but it's not that hard, time-consuming and gives it a nice effect on those shoulder pads um, and it works really well. Apply that to the cloaks and it becomes an absolute steamer and it's killing me. <laughs> what well, has done. I've just, I just finished it and I was on, I was on um, uh, Tommy Sewell's Instagram feed last night and they said, Oh, what are you doing? And I explained and <laughs> he nearly fell off his chair. I think he was like, dude, that's just far too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. But it, it you know, it's a it's a lesson learned because actually what I ended up doing is um is doing a final glaze on the cloak areas to bring them down to a slightly creamier colour. Mm. Um and then I've ended up weathering the bottom as well. So I it's not the same effect in a sense, in effect. They're not the same colour. And I ha- I know I've left the cloak cloaks on some of my other guys are a creamier. Some of the, you know, the original dudes from the last box set. Oh, slightly lighter. So I might look at those and go back and glaze them with the sepia again. But, you know, in, in a sense, I've, I've made a lot of schoolboy mistakes, really. That's taken me a lot longer. I do, I, however, think that the end result looks okay. Good. Just, well, that's a great, taken that's me a hell of a time to get it? there. <laughs> it's interesting what you said about, like, the gold being deeper. Cause I think when, I don't think we spoke about it. We may have done. I don't think we spoke about it when we talked about speed painting. Um, but it's also true of, of painting generally, I feel myself, that I always used to paint skin last. Always. Um, and then somebody told me about, I think it was a, a Games Workshop staff member called Tim, who was a legend and very good at painting told me about this idea of, of where stuff sits on the model. So at the time, I used to paint a lot of dwarves. And obviously, yeah. the skin is quite deep because you've got all that bushy beard over it. Yeah. So actually, yeah. skin became one of the first things I painted. And, um, and you know, that kind of concept stayed with me, whereby, you know, thinking about what's easy to get your brush to and what isn't, when painting it is is quite important and it's it actually forms part of the process if you're doing a test figure particularly if you're doing a test figure around how fast can i paint this is something to consider yeah I'm absolutely hopefully not teaching everyone to suck eggs some people may even disagree but that's fine um yeah but dude i've been painting for 25 years and i should have listened to that very sermon so. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just an interesting point and particularly um, at the moment when I'm painting models that are smaller, because, uh, Lord of the Rings figures being, being more of a 25 mil true scale, especially now when you go from painting an Age of Sigma Stormcast to a Lord of the Rings orc, and at some point yeah, I've got the hobbits yeah. to do, you know, <laughs> it's mental, mental difference. But, uh, well, I'm glad they're coming along. So is every model at that stage now from the start of set? Yeah. Apart from the characters, so I've left off the um the knight, um the 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 lord dude, and um I also did the Lord Celestin on foot that I got the if he's got a special character name, he's got a, he's actually a Garvey named character. Garvey Shawheart, I think it is. H- him, yeah. I've done him at the same time, so I I've separated those out because they're gonna need a little bit. I, do you know that there is a there is three models, so I'm, I said right back when we were talking about these when I first saw them that I didn't like them. Um and now I'm painting them, I don't like them at all. Um the the wizard ones. The evocators. <laughs> the evocators, right. Now, as a model, yeah, they're fine. 
but the the places where they've put the the join seams are, is absolutely flipping ridiculous right across where the cloak dang hangs and I had an absolute nightmare trying to flatten one. One of them I ended up green stuffing over because it just looked horrific. And I, I really disappointed with that one. And there's not much I can do to fix it. Um, cause I just couldn't, the, I should have green stuffed it right at the start rather than, um, do what I did, which is to try uh, and, and do it with liquid green stuff and then gloss varnish, which didn't work at all. But, mm. but I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think that, even with the mistakes I made doing it, because I, I suppose the, tr- the truth is I was rushing a bit, I think the place where that seam is put is, is ludicrous. Yeah. And it's really obvious and really not easy to get to and on a curved surface and so many reasons why. And and perpendicular to the to the direction of the curves as well, of, of the flow of the cloak. So it's just a stupid place to put it. And... There must be good reasons to do with the model construction and blah de blah de blah but it's almost as dumb as having the seam run straight through the centre of the shoulder pad on all of the <laughs> easy easy build stormcast. It's ridiculous. But um that's my little little bugbear, but otherwise I actually really love the models and I've enjoyed painting them. If there wouldn't so many of them I'd have enjoyed painting them. Um if you know what I mean. Mm. But they're not far off being done and I can't wait to see the whole army together. I'm currently green stuffing the bases. Um, the problem I is, I suppose, be- with it. Sorry, go on. You're green stuffing the bases. I was just going to say I might have to invest in one of them green stuff rollers at some point. Oh yeah. If I'm going to do more of the army, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was going to say is with the easy build stuff, um, it's difficult without having because the because the stormcast pad is curved. So, if you imagine. Well, this is what how I feel it is. If you imagine two halves of a solid metal mould coming together, you can't have the pad extending past half of the mould and into the other mould with a curve on it because it won't be able to come apart again. So you've got to have that seam down the middle. So are the solder pads not one thing on the on the normal box set. Yeah, they're one thing, but they're they're cast the other way. So like because they're separate piece. Mm. So, so the thing is, so I if suppose, they left the piece, if they left the pad separate, yeah, sure, you can do it that way. But they don't have that. They've never done that for the. And they certainly haven't done it for the intercessors. No, but the, the, the intercessors, it's it's to do, it's difficult to describe it. It's... <laughs> Go on, Dan, defend that crap. <laughs> no, no. So a shoulder pad of a space marine, right, is like it's curved on the top, in it. But it's not curved underneath. It goes to a sense of, like a, if you look a, at the corner. A flat edge. Yeah. Whereas the Stormcast pad, if you look at it from the side on, it's curved over and underneath yeah. is curved over. Yeah, I'll buy it. I, I suppose. Listen, in all honesty, I could be completely wrong, but that's what I think is the case, so... Yeah, I, I suppose so, but I think I'd rather they didn't put the seam straight through the middle of it. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, <laughs> shall we move on to some talking about chipping? Yes, I love chipping. I love chips as well. Well, I'm going to confess, right, so last week, so um, I, I think, was it last week I was eating grapes and I said this is a, a pea losing my... So I've joined Slimming World again. Um, that's not my confession. My confession is after going uh, last week and weighing in and having lost three and a half pounds, I went straight to the chippy and bought a large bag of chips <laughs> <laughs> and, ate, and then went home and grated cheese on them and ate them. And I was like, yeah. And Harriet was like, how many sins was that? And I was like, I don't even care. <laughs> it was good. So if I go tomorrow evening and I haven't lost any weight, it's because of the chips. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, completely not required segue about chips. Chipping, chipping. So I I thought I'd talk about two different ways of chipping, and I think Dan will probably be able to help out with the second way more than I will. Um, so the first way is the actual painted on method. Uh, and the second way is using um, chipping fluid, 
which um, is a, was a new product to me, actually. I've discovered it talking to Dan on this podcast. So um, and using chipping fluid, and I think Dan will be able to help a bit more with that. Um, so the first one, I'm going to explain how, I, how, how I've learned to do it um, and how I, essentially most people do it. So once you've painted your model, um, so for example, for me, it's my space walls I use this mainly, or my orcs. I then take, um, for the space walls, I take the space with grey, the lightest colour, and I use a sponge, uh, and I stipple it on. And I do that subtly, so not all of the little bits are going to end up being full chips. I then go back in with the brush and take the ones that are big enough, I put a brown in. And that brown is a, is a brown of your choice. I tend to use, um, uh, scorched brown, but you could, you could use Mourn Fang, you could use pretty much any brown you choose to use. I think it's probably um, worth, I'm, sorry, I was going to not interrupt, but it, it's, you know, it just comes naturally. It's worth saying that Rhinox Hide is the match, isn't it? To scorch. Oh, Rhinox Hide, yes, same, but Yeah, it, no, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, no, you're right. It is Rhinox Hide that I use. Because of those, <laughs> pe- you know, the hordes of people that are listening because of our accurate descriptions of how to do things. Yeah. Um, and then I work it in and what I tend to do with the brown is, is make sure that you end up with a highlight across the bottom. So if you've got a blue blob, um, you put the brown on so that the blue shows most at the bottom and not at the top, um, which can be a bit fiddly. Um, and then if it's a big enough chip, I put in silver. Now we had a long conversation about this on, um, painting our little chat about when it comes to space moon armor, for example, which, which is ceramite silver. Now it's not, it's, it's a ceramic. It's like a metal ceramic. And every time it's described, it's like a cream color. Um, but I think people use silver because it, it, rever- it reverberates with people a little bit more. It's re- more recognizable and understandable to the eye what it is. Um, so that's one way of doing it. And what that gives you is the little, light colored dots that you didn't put the brown in look like tiny little flecks of of chipping if that makes any sense dan yeah now the other way of doing it is to start with um a darker color so get the rhinox hide um and um sponge that on or paint that on if you want to paint on a chip i think it's probably better if you start with the dark way rather than the sponge and then once you've got your painted on chip, and I usually do this for like scratches. So where something is run across the surface, I will paint that on with the Rhinox hide. Uh, and then you highlight along the bottom edge with your brightest highlighting color. And I usually do a mixture of those two techniques. So the, the sort of chipping goes on first and then those big scratches with the high under highlight go on next. Um, and I'll be looking at the edges and thinking about whether the areas that I've got with the sponge can be turned into a chip or a scratch um a bigger chip or a scratch and and work in that way too um and that that gets done before you put on any of the weathering powders or oils or streaking grime or anything like that um does that sound is that anywhere is that how you do it dan uh yeah yeah i i would say so there's a few th- few bits i was thinking about as i go through so first thing to think about so ben mentioned use a sponge um when you're looking at a sponge, depending on the, the sort of the density of the sponge will affect sort of the spread. The sort of chip. So yeah. the perfect sponge that I have found, and I didn't find it, I was shown it, is the sponge you get from a Games Workshop carry case. Uh, and you used to get it in the blister pack. So I've got some of the stuff from one of the pick and pluck cases um, yeah. that I've got a store of, uh, and I use that. But you can you you can deliberately use bigger and smaller sponges, and I would just experiment um, for that. Uh, second thing I would add is have a think about again. We said last week, or last week, last time about what are your chipping. So, for example, on yes. my salamanders, yeah, I should have said that. That's that's why there's two of us, my friend. <laughs> yeah. um, so with my salamanders, one of the reasons I wanted the chip was because I wanted it to look um, battle warm. But the other reason was I wanted to bosh out space marines quickly because in Heresy, you've got units 15 and 20. So I didn't edge highlight any of the armor of my salamanders. 
Uh, and now, I should say, like, there, there are some... That's not to say that whenever you do weathering, you don't edge highlight. That's that's not what I'm saying. But it was... Because I do with my cause, space Because you do, and lots of excellent painters do. But for me, chipping allowed me to skip a step, which is really quite tedious, especially over a large number of miniatures, mm. because I did chipping. Um, so that that worked. Um it's worth saying I still had highlighting going on because I used my airbrush and did some Zenith stuff, but so that was good because it was quick. Um, um, oh, and again, speed wise on infantry, particularly if you're going for numbers rather than individual miniature appearance. Um, so my, again, with my salamanders, none of my chips are highlighted. So I literally do the chips with Rhinox hide and then paint in, um, some of the bigger ones, as Ben said, with the silver, uh, and that's it on the chipping. Um, so you can, you, you have got that speedier option. And Dan will put up pictures of his salamanders as well, just so you can see. Yeah. <laughs> Won't you, Dan? Yes, Ben. <laughs> I will. Um, and then finally, the other thing I was going to say is, what you can do if you're working, if you, it's usually it's only convenient if you if you're airbrushing, um, is I when I'm ready to start weathering chipping, I spray the model with with the coat of gloss varnish, uh, mm. and the reason I do that is because it, it and this I was shown this by um by the MKA guys that what is now Colter Paint um is, is like a is what Andy Wardle set up and done. Um, after MK stopped and it's like a save point in a game so what it does is it says right that's done now um so it's worth saying that you'd be doing this after transfers probably so going back you won't be able to adjust those transfers now but it means that if you make a mistake which when you are looking at your model you've just happily painted and then you've just gone and done some chips on it you might do um you can take it back off because if you use a bit of, um, I think it's airbrush thinner, one is more effective than the other. And a, it's thinner, I think, is, um, get that and a, and a, a cotton bud and soak it in it and then gently just wipe it over where you've put the paint. You can take it back off again. Um, which is very useful. <laughs> I have found. Yeah. Um, so those are the bits I would add to chipping with sponge. I suppose that the other thing to say is always when you're doing the chipping, don't just go mental. Have a think about where the chipping is going to occur, especially on tanks. It's not going to occur everywhere. So have a look at where where people will be getting in and out of hatches, the areas which might take them more fire. Um, so, for example, on Primaris, I tend to do a lot around the legs because they'll be smashing their way through concrete and what have you, and on the pauldrons. If you, whereas if you don't get if much you're weathering on the or orcs, you could just put them all on their head. <laughs> Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, the, the second way is, is using something called chipping fluid. Um, where it's, it's large, it's better used with an airbrush. You lay down your base color of a brown or, or whatever, actually. So, um, it could be the silver and you could do it with the brown and then whatever. Um, you lay down your base color, the one that you want to be revealed by the chips. You then gloss varnish that. And then you put on your chipping fluid through the airbrush across the whole thing. And then you lay down, um, whatever color scheme you want. So, um, once you've got that and say, for example, it's a base coat, um, and a couple of highlights, you then using hot water and a, a toothpick or a cotton wool bud, you chip away at that paint and it will reveal the brown underneath. It will just flake off. Um, and when you're happy with the effect that you've got, you then seal that bad boy with another varnish. Um, and then you can move on to your other stages. One of the best people I've seen using this on infantry models is the real broken fingers. Um, and his models are stunning. But when you get the perfect balance of weathering and you can have a look at his stuff to her and he's got a great guide where he, he works his through the steps with you on a, on a redemptor dreadnought. And you can go and have a look and, and see that in action. But that, that's essentially the way it's done. Um, so 
After you've done those chips, of course, you can highlight around the edges if you want to, and you can build them up. He does that, and he explains very well how to do that. Um, or you could just leave them. Uh, some people do that. So I think that's um, that's chipping in a nutshell, isn't it, Dan? Yeah, and I think um, the only bits I would add to that is so the way it, it's if you imagine it's a layer of of um, paint, see through paint, I suppose that that you activate by getting getting it wet so you just need to think but make sure that if you're holding the model especially if it's like a tank so you're actually holding the model you know your fingers are dry and you're not gonna activate it by with with you know any dampness on your on your fingers and stuff in areas you don't want to so that's really worth yeah. doing make sure you do the gloss varnish before you put it on um, because otherwise you you will just remove paint all the way back to the base coat um yeah the other thing to bear in mind is you don't have to put a single solid color on as your base coat so it's particularly on tanks I've seen some lovely examples online where people spray lots of different oranges and and browns and all over like almost like a rust um yeah. modulation and then put it on so that's really good um and it's also a nice way uh, and this is again this is something i was shown on a painting course to do if you're going to do uh say a stripe down the middle of your tank that would have been painted afterwards if you put the mask off the stripe then put the chipping fluid on sorry mask off the stripe and then varnish obviously and then chipping fluid and then spray the stripe the color you want you can work away along the edges of the stripe to give quite a realistic look to the the effect. idea that the 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 extra color is chipped off separately to the the stuff underneath yeah um so yeah i, I suppose the other thing last thing to mention before we wrap this section up is you can achieve a very similar effect for um but you have you have to use an airbrush with this one you can't paint it with salt so put in a little patch of wet where you want to reveal after you've done your base you know your, your under color Put a little patch on of, of wet and then dip that in salt and then we've got that all over and then spray the whole lot and then you can just re remove the salt and it will um will reveal the colour underneath. So that's another way of doing it. There are um, loads of ways. I mean, uh, hopefully, if nothing else, us chatting about it just inspires people to have a look online because, as we always say, there are there are people that are far are better, much better at doing this. Um, yeah. we're just you know talking about it from our point of view so we're muddling along yeah <laughs> muddling um, along for a fairly lengthy hobby desk there so thank you for listening <laughs> and uh, i think it's time for us to head into the galaxy of war absolutely to the pod aren't we already in the pod well i haven't talked about the drop pods for like loads of episodes well i don't fit in it mm, i think my um, haven't been, haven't, my ability haven't been to, to enough fit would be months. dubious <laughs> Especially after them chips. <laughs> right, the pod that I haven't mentioned in ages thunders further onwards. Um towards the dark edges now where only the rogue traders are found. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> it's galaxy of war ben whoa anything at all happened in the galaxy of war that you're interested in no nah. nothing no not really who no. am i kidding it's been flipping ridiculous <laughs> it's been flipping ridiculous i am so overwhelmed with 40k at the moment i uh i don't genuinely know i i Desperately want to do a kill team. I desperately want to do my space wolves. I desperately want to do some more forty k. But well, why don't you start us off? Because have you had a chance to read your your space wolf codex now? I, I can. I have. Yeah. Well, not fully, but I have. I've had a good flick through. And um, as ever with us, if you want to have a full, in depth, tactical analysis of the space wolf codex, you're listening to the wrong podcast. Um, <laughs> the oh. bits that, <laughs> first of all it's gorgeous it's it's everything that i expect from the current games workshop books um there's loads of cool artwork in there um 
I think there's a few odd little tiny problems that like the same as you get with all the codexes recently. There's been the odd one or two things, but the FAQ will sort those those things out. I think what's so let's I mean let's, I'm trying to approach this in the way I approached it, which is I dive straight in to find out how the space will get on with the Primaris. Um because I think that's an important that was important for me. Um and what the first thing that hit me was um well, actually, the structure of the Space Force has changed a little bit. Um, so they've distinctly now got rid of the concept that it, the the kind of shoulder pads match your um, you know, age within the chapter. It's it's very much to do with um, what role you have in it. So the red and black is the, the Grey Hunters and the Intercessors, for example, and the, the red and yellow is the Inceptors and the Blood Claws. Um, but the Primaris, there's a really cool part that I wanted to share with everyone. Um, so as ever, as with all the chapters, nothing's changed really when it comes to how the Primaris are, are viewed. Some of the wolf lords are like, yeah, bring them on. I'll have all of them. Um, and others are not particularly keen. Um, and one of the things that they had the issue with is that space wolf selection is very specific and, and very arduous. Uh, one particular part of it is is unique to the space wolves that... It, the, for them is you're almost not a space wolf if you haven't done it um which is the test of morkai where they send you right out into the wilderness in quite literally your underpants and you've got to get back to the fang and it talks a lot about how the primaris weren't really considered space wolves because they hadn't done the test of morkai um and they fought really well in the battles and everyone was like yeah they're all right i guess and then the primaris themselves decided to go back to to Fenris and all undertake the test of Morkai and I think that's flipping awesome <laughs> I think that's flipping awesome um, and unfortunately some of them didn't make it um, it says no small few did not return um, so mm, so there we go so not all of them made it back so the test of Morkai has its yeah, they're Primaris as well so they're yeah, not yeah. even um, so that's so quite cool so what you're saying about the markings then because I know Traditionally, the idea was that the Blood Claws squads were like big, and then yeah. they all went to battle. And after fighting for eight years, some of them became Grey Hunters when they. Yeah. But, a lo- but those squads are deliberately smaller because some of them had died. Yeah. And then Long Fangs were like the pack continued to the point where they lost a load. Yeah. And then there was Long Fangs. So is that gone? No, that's still there for the basic Astartes. Mm-hmm. Um, but the in. The Primaris have kind of added on to that. So the ones that are more close assault orientated and in your face are the, you know, the Inceptors and they get their, you know, the, the red and yellow. So I'm not really sure. I, I think one of the problems that this book suffers from is the same one that I had with the Space Moons book. It's very snapshot. It is the Primaris almost as they've just turned up or maybe a little bit time afterwards if that makes any sense. It doesn't really talk about how the new recruits into the chapter are being dealt with from Mm. Fenris. Because, I mean, clearly there is a decision to be made, isn't there? They've been given the technology of how to make a Primaris Marine by call. So when they've selected their Fenrisian um, aspirant, do they make them a Primaris or a Startes? Do they have that choice? Who, if there is a choice, who makes a choice? Is it the ch- chapter that makes the choice, or is it the? Because theoretically, all of the problems that the Space Wolves had with the Primaris would be completely mitigated if the if they'd gone through the selection process that they all had. Yeah. So it doesn't cover any of that, and I found that really frustrating. And I found that really frustrating about the Space Marine book, but it is what it is. I'm expecting. To be honest, a bit like Age of Sigma, this wave of Age of Sigma is is much better. It's more fleshed out. I expect the, the Primaris to have the same effect. So the next wave of kind of background will will bring all that stuff to life. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully there was a rumor of um, seeing some more Primaris towards the end of the of this year. End yeah, of the year. I think it would be nice because, um. I know, like, Stormcast are completely new, um, whereas Primaris are, like, an addition to Space Marines. But when you look at the Stormcast, and I, and I have no problem with this at all, because I love Stormcast, there are 69 
like when you do the like product thing, the number of products under Stormcast Eternals when I last checked was sixty nine, which is a lot of stuff. Which yeah. in comparison to the, the, the Primaris is quite low. And and I have to be honest, like I still I like I do love Space Marines and um and I do love Primaris, but right now I really struggle with the idea of doing a Space Marine army because I just there's so many unanswered questions. Yeah. No, I can see that. And I and I think this I think that really they've lost their kind of who they are a little bit in the game as well because a basic Astartes I don't think in 8th edition is competitive at all mm. I really don't I, I, you know when I'm watching the whole 10 man squads get mown down with very little problem by a 5 man squad of uh, Scions <laughs> you're going to say that well it, it is true though isn't it you know for, and they're like a quarter of or half the points it, it's, it's, for, it's phenomenally frustrating um, anyway one of the cool things I very much liked is they put the Reavers in with the Scouts rather than the Fast Attack, which is perfect. Um, other bits of background that I really liked, um, or one bit that really frustrated me, remember we talked about Dreadnoughts? Yeah. And how I wondered how they would view Redemptor Dreadnoughts. Yeah. Out of all of the entries describing what the units are, the Redemptor Dreadnought has the smallest. <laughs> it, it's It's... Eight lines. What Which does is, it say? Um, I can read it out. It's not. There's not that much of it. So designed by Archmagus Belisarius Call, at the behest of Primarch Reboot Gilliman, many centuries ago, the mighty Redemptor Dreadnoughts have only recently been unleashed against the Imperial's foe, Imperium's foes. Given motion by a fallen battle brother, Redemptors are swift and utterly lethal. Adversaries are shredded apart by a monstrous heavy Gatling cannon why the star- starburst power of a macro-plasma incinerator shakes, makes short work of enemy armour and vehicles. Um, and absolutely no mention of how the Space Wolves view those at all. Mm. Wolf and Dreadnoughts. I actually really like the idea. I'm not a big fan of Wolfen, but if you've been fighting for thousands of years, like Dreadnoughts do, if you're left awake for too long, and put in the direst of circumstances, I can see a Space Wolf Dreadnought becoming a Wolfen. Yeah. It, it makes sense to me. If the others can fall to the Wolfen, then I don't see why they wouldn't either. Yep. So that makes sense. I'm quite happy to see that in there. I probably won't make or use one, because I, I prefer the other side of the Space Wolves. Um, so some rules things I'd like to point out, because I, I have actually read some of the rules as well, which is quite <gasps> unbelievable. I'm going to pick yep. out the ones I really like. True Grit um, is a Space Wolf exclusive um, stratagem. And in the shooting phase, I can select a Space Wolf infantry within one inch of an enemy, so in close combat effectively. Their bolters, bolt rifles, auto bolt rifles and bolt carbons can fire as if they had the stats pistol too. Ah. Which is wicked, isn't it? That is um, How many command points was that? One. One. So... I think this one really comes into its own when you're thinking about a Primaris squad. So say mm-hmm. a Primaris squad with the, the carbines or the bolt, bolt rifles, uh, you know, with that extra AP on the bolt rifles, um, and their extra attack in close combat, you're, you're going to get some, I think that's going to bring them up to sort of punching level really quite nicely. Um, so I really like that as a, as a, um, stratagem. Um, yeah. Lone Wolf. Had, the Lone Wolf had to come out, really, didn't it? Because it's just such a phenomenal strategy. So this one is um, at the end of the phase, um, you can select a, a Space Wolf entry unit where it's been reduced to a single model, and you can effectively turn that model into a character. Um, it's it's awesome. Yeah. It really, really is. Um, unfortunately, there is a con that you can no longer get um the uh the lone wolf as a as a as a choice as a unit choice yeah um which you used to be able to do in the index um lots of people there's a few things that are missing out there like uh iron priest on a on a thunder wolf um i think i think the wolf priest on a bike that kind of stuff sort of stuff that was missing from the 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 um 
Space Marine book. People can still use them if they're in the index. I don't know how long that's going to last, though, to be honest, mate. I can see that going with the next edition to the codexes. Yeah, well, oh. the indexes are all, most be, must be all but obsolete. Well, you can still use a unit from the index if it is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so that's that's quite cool. Uh, one of the things I was disappointed not to see was the lion and the wolf. Um, but then it was pointed out by Rob from Games Virtual Plymouth that you know you need to have an a Dark Angels detachment in the Space Wolves to have for it to make any point. And then if they're in there, you can have it anyway, which is pretty cool. Um, what uh, I mean, I've, we've spoken about that before, but effectively, it can it can add you know, for very very little part a fifty fifty chance of losing a wound. You you can buff up um, you know a character stats by plus one to their weapon skill, strength, and attacks and leadership for the duration of the battle. I and mean, could you imagine Ragnar Blackmane with that? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. Have any um, of the characters become primaris? No. No, but then I'm not surprised either, because they didn't do that with the others. Oh, yeah. Um, some things that I've noticed reading through that I probably would have noticed if I'd properly played the Space Wars before, but the Frost Sword and the Frost Axe are both very useful um, and unique weapons. Um, particularly at the Frost Sword, it gives you kind of the best of both worlds between a Power Sword and a Power Axe. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Frost Axe is Strength 6, so I mean, it's just awesome. Any um, wolf tooth necklaces? Oh, as um, oh, I didn't see that. I'm not going to embarrass myself by flicking through or making that up. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing. So the tempestus discipline for the psyker, I really liked it. Um, apparently, I don't know this for certain because I haven't got the Dark Angels book. But apparently, one of the rules, one of them is, um, a lesser version of a Dark Angel power. Which I think is hilarious. Oh, right. <laughs> but I, I haven't got the Dark Angel book to, to compare because, you know, I need to wash my hands every time I read it. Um, <laughs> but there's one in there that I wanted to point out. So, number four, um, that can be used on itself. Uh, it's called the Fury of the Wolf Spirits. Until the next psychic phase, the Una gains six melee attacks at strength five, AP minus three, D1. That's amazing. <laughs> so it, yeah. basically, you can have a psycho wigging out, <laughs> swinging his axe around. Love it. So he's that's I'm quite chuffed with that. Um, and re- I think that's really um, thematic as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So overall, I'm I'm really that's about as rulesy as I'm going to get because I know we we've been trying to do that with the codexes and I, I, I've tried my best for this one. I only got it yesterday, or day before yesterday, so um, there we go. Um, cool. Well, um, I'm, very, I'm I, all very happy. Good. Well, I'm glad it's, it's here. Full, I'm pleased It's full of you. pretty pictures as well. Oh, well, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Um, my favourite thing about the new Space Wolf release is um, in White Dwarf this month, you know they did do the administratum, like the Munitorum reports with the highs and lows. Yeah, yeah. One of the highs is um is called excellent hair, <laughs> <laughs> um, and it says that space wolves often don't wear a helmet, and they say that that's because it dulls their senses, but actually it's just to show off their awesome hair. Yes, which I think is very true. Yeah. So, so that's cool. So, moving on then. So, that's an exciting release. We've also got this month, um, Canis Rex, the Night Preceptor, um, yeah. is coming out. So, he was previewed ages ago. Um, what was, I didn't realize he? is that Canis Rex is a special character version of the Night Preceptor. Um, I don't yes. know how I missed that because I've got the codex, but I was in pay attention. So, he's got, a Laz Impulsor. Um, not only is it a deadly weapon, uh, uh, it can either sort of go pew 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 all over the place, which is 36 inch range, 2d6 shots, uh, strength 6, minus 2, um, uh, not Ren, that, minus 2 AP, 
and um, D3 damage. Or when you get close to it, it can do 1D6, but they're strength 12 with a minus Ooh. 4 and D6 damage. So that's pretty nasty. Uh-huh. So is. that's cool. But what I really liked was there's a really cool bit of background um, in the the Knight Codex about that weapon. And how it was originally only made on these, this like trio of three worlds. And then in the heresy, one of those worlds turned traitor and the other two were overrun and destroyed. So they thought they'd lost the, lost the technology. And then, um, an explorator fleet with a load of knights turned up at uh, the worlds and beat up loads of orcs that were all over the worlds and got the STC back. And then the, I think it might have been the Iron Warriors. Might have been, don't know. Some Chaos Marines rocked up and led an attack on the world that had the STC and stole it. Um, and that technology was taken and employed by the Dark Mechanicum. And then a load of Black Templars and um, a very angry Freeblade went on a mental mission into the Eye of Terror and stole it back again. <laughs> so, um, yeah, cool bit of background for that weapon. So they're basically like back and forwarding with it. Yeah, so it's obviously a really good weapon. Because <laughs> everyone the, the, wants it. It's effectively an upgrade sprue, isn't it? Yeah, so it's £95 kit. Um, you can still build the other knight's out of it, the, the the knights of that size that are in that chassis, yeah, obviously, um, and it comes with him on foot, yeah, as well, and you can open up the little um flap thing at the top, and he's sat in there. That's yeah, I wonder cool. what else is on the upgrade sprue. Any other little gubbins that you can share around your knights? Be quite exciting to see a picture of it, to be honest. Yes, well, when it goes on pre-order. It will have, um, a, have a look. It will, yeah. You'll be able to have a look at the sprues because they do nice pictures of the sprues now, don't they? which is cute. Yes, they do. They do. They do. Are you going to get one? Nope. Okay. No, I'm not. Not because I don't like it. I love it, but I haven't. I haven't got. Um, I haven't got a knight army. I think it's something I'd like to do, um, but not yet. I'm not. I'm not. Um, Entirely happy with the knight I've already painted. I'm probably going to go back and work in into him a little bit. There are some nice wolf's heads emblems and stuff on the sprue. Yeah, because it's Canis Rex. So. Yeah, that's true. Cool. So the other right. thing we've got to talk about is Rogue Trader, isn't it? Rogue Trader. Oh, or oh, Rogue Trader and Speed Freaks because they're two box sets. They're coming out. We'll cover Speed Freaks, I suppose, in more detail. But we've seen pictures of that. Um, Obviously, don't know the price yet, but it's based on Vigilus, which is the same place as um, the Tooth and Claw um, is based. Just as an interesting tidbit, um, oh. in the in the desert. So one of the f- the first when the, the warp storm erupted, um, you know, they split the galaxy in half. It kind of show it shot a load of um, debris at the planet, and one of those things was a you know kind of an orc invasion fleet that had been stuck in the warp forever. Um, and they, they've been roaming around the deserts of Vigilus ever since, um, on their bikes and their cars. And, um, so that's, that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> looking forward to that, actually. I'm not gonna, I'm probably not gonna pick it up because if I do, I'll end up doing an orc army and I can't face that. N- not yet. Maybe for the future, but, but it's really nice to see <laughs> them getting some cool models. Really nice. Oh, it's wonderful, isn't it? In fact, what I've really liked as well is, um, the community team. Um, because the orc players, I love them. Like, I've seen so many funny posts from them as well. Every time there's a new release about, yeah, it's cool, but where's the war? Yeah. And then people will come on and they'll put in a... <laughs> there was a great one where somebody put, right, this is an orc post yeah. now. We're stealing it. When's the orcs coming? And then the community team were like, right, orcs, seriously, stop hijacking all the posts or we'll have to send in the Ordo Xenos <laughs> the Death Watch and I'm just like this is brilliant so yeah I'm pleased I'm pleased for the Orc players they're getting some cool new models 
um, updating that <laughs> old buggy um, for something amazing. The videos they've been doing are amazing. Um, yeah, they're really all key as well, the vehicles. It's just great. Really great um, to see. And the game looks like it might be interesting. There's yeah, some yeah. cool markers looks and stuff. Looks like a cross between um, um, Gork and Walker and an X-Wing in a weird kind of way, but we'll see. Yes, yeah. I wonder, um, I wonder, and I hope it is the case, but I, I wonder if the the vehicle will oh. come out on its own. Oh, I don't think at so. At the same time? I don't think so. No. no. Um, so Rogue Trader. We've got a little bit more of an idea of what it is. It's um, an expansion to play in closed in- environments, like corridors and stuff. Um, it, the idea is that you'll be able to pack your literally entire kill team into a, a tiny little case, um, including the scenery. Um, comes with two kill teams, so the the rogue trader and her little retinue, um, and basically some discharge and pustules and other fetidness accumulated into blobs. Um, <laughs> the Elis... El, what is it called? Elucidion or Luc- Elucidian Star Striders are yeah. uh, her band. The the thingy's band. The other guys are made yeah. from the Gellapox. So, um, the game comes with the rules for them in Kill Team, and it also comes with the rules in 40k, which I thought was cool. You get a little codex for them. It'd be nice to see yep. kill, like a rogue trader running around 40k battlefields. Um, be interesting to see how much of an impact she'd make in a 40k game, or whether or not she just, or he or she would just be there as um as an oddity. I do like oddities in 40k armies, but <laughs> but yeah, I I think I'm still not entirely completely sure why they've released that so close to the back on the back of um Kill Team, but um mm. I like the premise of it, and I I love the models. Even the Nurgle ones are great, so um, I think this this has got some selling points. And if it's got Nurglings in it, that instead of Nurglings, they're called like Glitchlings, and instead of infecting humans, they infect machines, cool. which is quite cool. Also, what I think is quite interesting is she the the Codex, which is the Codex Elucidion Star Striders. That isn't. It's not like Codex Rogue Traders. It's specifically. Yeah. Her band. So, which I like because it gives a lot of variety possible for the future because different rogue traders would operate in very different ways. Yeah. I think that's one of the key things about the box set is actually reading it. They're using it as a vehicle to explore the lesser explored parts of 40k. The bits that you, the bits that you can't really yeah, do absolutely. on a, you know, on a, on a, on a, on a battlefield, really sensibly. Um, so one of the things I think that we are going to see, perhaps, is maybe because they've not done an Inquisition army, um, they're dotted around in other no. books. But I'd be really cool to see in Inquisitor kill teams. You know, that's a nice, that's an awesome way of putting them into forty k, um, and um, yeah, with a with a retinue and you know the the army that they've gathered to achieve whatever goal it is. Um, that they're after. So I, th- I think it's, I think it's quite a cool, cool little way of doing things, to be honest. Ooh. 80 pounds? Yeah. I'm not sure. It's not as good a value as the, as the, uh, as the kill team box. But then. Does it come with the actual rules for kill team? That's a very good question, and I don't know. Or is it just an expansion? I think it's just an expansion, is the gist I've got. So there we go. Kill team. Rogue trader. I'm really excited yeah. about that. Um, I'm really liking Kill Team, actually. Um, that's a really fast way of playing 40k games. I mean, we, you've mm. the terrain in it is a is a lot like the Necromunda terrain was. Well, that's the other thing. You you, you you're going to end up if you've got Necromunda in this having like a whole box full of just gubbins. Yeah, it's ace actually. One side of the board is like the interior of a shuttle. Yep, and with a little bridge and a little command seat. Great for oh, role that's, playing. That's brilliant, yeah. Oh, dude, Tristan's going to be over the moon. There's a guy with a little hat on that's just like <laughs> a Thunderbird's hat. <laughs> Excellent. I, I just noticed. That's brilliant. Awesome. So, shall we? Shall we move into the uh, yeah, into bit. the mortal realms, Mister Jolly? We should move into the mortal realms because, oh no, one last thing. One last thing. So, 
there's a new Kyphus K novel coming, mate. Is there? Yeah, Choose Your Enemies, it's called. Um, and it says, Kyphus Kane and the Valhallen 597 find themselves in the thick of the action once again, much to Kane's chagrin. <laughs> Taking on a chaos uprising in an imperial mining world. And it's funny, it says, Commissar Kane, one of the greatest heroes, and then it's got a little star. This is debatable, but the conceit is maintained to boost morale <laughs> within the ranks. <laughs> So yeah, I love Kane. I I absolutely love the Kane books, um, and I will be getting that and reading that, which is saying quite a lot because you know what I'm like. I don't really read. No, anymore. you don't. That's true. You don't. All right, dude. <laughs> Let- Shall we go? Let's do it to the mortal round. Do it. Welcome back to the Mortal Realms. Oh, it's, again, it's been a bit of a quiet one, really. It's like Soul Wars came out, and then there's been nothing, in a sense, in a weird kind of way. Um, well, we've had a few teasers now, haven't we, of the next steps? Oh, no, you're right. We have had a few teasers. Um, one particularly is quite exciting, I think, for a lot of people. Um, so what we were going to cover is we we're going to cover Night, Night Vault, because I think that's pretty cool. And then we were going to talk about Beastman a bit, weren't we? Yep. And then we were going to have a chat about our next little topic, which was, was chaos. Unfortunately, someone conned me into that. But we'll... So Night Vault, Dan, what do you think? Well, as I said just before we started, I don't really know a lot about it. Um, I think it's exciting because it will be more cool new miniatures, um, which which is ace to see. The, the new... Oh, the war band with that flying, excuse me, banshee woman with the flowers around her and stuff. That is amazing. Just amazing. Yeah, it um, is. They're really nice little unit. Yeah. The thing with Shade Spire and Night Vault, I'm excited because I'd like to see the background. So that'd be good. Um, the reason I, I, I probably won't be buying into this stage is that I hadn't, haven't kept up with with um shade spire with yeah. all the like cards and models and i'm not that I, d- I don't know i just i just don't want to put the time into deck building and stuff like that i'd rather be playing other things which is fine you know that's that's not that's not saying there's anything wrong with those things it's just not one that i've kept up with and i i really liked it shade spire i enjoyed playing it but i just it it reminds me a bit of like Magic the Gathering. So I used to love doing Magic the Gathering um, for a bit, but then I dropped out of it. And now I just wouldn't know where to start. I just wouldn't yeah. know where to start getting into it. And it's a similar thing with Night Vault. So I won't, I won't, I say, I won't say I won't, but I'm unlikely to buy into Night Vault uh, more than just looking at it and going, ooh. But that's fine because other people will love it. So. It's nice in a way, I'm not going to lie, at the moment, when something comes along and you're like, yep, that's not on my list, it's it's a relief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I can imagine it is, actually. Yeah. So, what do I think of Nightfall? I think, well, clearly what they're doing is phases, isn't there? So, this is a clearly a new phase to Underworlds. Shade Spire is not a thing anymore, in the sense that this has kind of superseded it in a sense. So Underworlds is the game system, isn't it? That's become very clear. Um, Shades, Shadespire is a the setting. last one. A setting. Um, and I suppose you could run a tournament based on Shadespire. Still, yeah. you could say Shadespire cards, bosh. I think they have said that the Shadespire stuff's going to port over, though. Oh, yeah, so you can use all of the... Um, um, all of the Shadespire cards and, and, and gangs in the Underworld settings against Night Vault stuff. And I'm sure there'll be Night Vault cards which apply to, um, you know, to the Shadespire gangs too. Um, the, and the key things that they're bringing in essentially is, is magic. That's, oh, the, yes. that's the new big thing. So, um, that's a whole game mechanic that 
I don't know whether that's going to come in as a whole new phase or whether it's just going to be cards that you play. Um, don't know yet, but um, model wise, I think that's that's the thing, isn't it? With these, well, the thing that I love about Shadespire above everything else is that you get really wicked, very nicely sculpted starters box sets or sample box sets for a faction. Mm. Um, so four fire slayers or skelly bobs or, um, the stormcast, all of those things were really cool. And so gateways or just little tasters give you a chance to paint something else for a change. Um, and I enjoy painting all of the ones that I've done. I've still got the skaven and the dwarves to do, and I, but I will do those. Um, and this looks like exactly the same. So I have to say, um, the evocators don't, they don't strike me as much as the chain rasp, but I think the chain rasp gang is flipping ridiculously cool. <laughs> you've got a guy being hung, you've got a dude carrying his head. I mean, it's, it's excellent. <laughs> and it's really wicked. And that, that banshee lady run with a sort of string of flowers is, is superb. Whereas the evocators don't look that much different from, um, the ones in the Soul Wars box set, I don't think. They don't strike me as being that that, that much better or different. So, a bit of a shame. Uh, the, the, I mean, the character dude is excellent. I like him. Standing on the rock and staff above his head with fire in his hand. I think that's pretty cool. But, it, you know, it would have been nice to see the other two looking a bit more different. But um... Well, I reckon they should mix it up and do... Um different shaped boards like hexagons it might be interesting just something a bit different yeah I think one of the coolest things about the whole kind of reveal is that you've got that flying squig which is just awesome yeah and um, and the troll so I, I'm hoping that that's maybe an indicator of something to come please please games workshop please yeah so those are the exciting more exciting bits for me i suppose are those previews of things that like that a goblin gang (laughs) yeah i love goblins (laughs) so i can't wait for that um oh god you know it completely slipped my mind because i saw it and wanted to puke um the the tease of uh, slanesh Oh yeah, the video. Yeah. So yeah, but what's interesting about that is that that's like um, they've called it something different. Yeah, the Realm it's... of Chaos, Wrath and Rapture. Do you reckon yeah. it's going to be a, a box game to kick it off? Probably. They seem to like their box games. Or, or maybe something like um, the Nurgle one. I mean, so not an actual box game like say um, <sighs> Necromunda or whatever, but or Speed Freaks. Probably a better example. Something more like Blight Wars. Yeah. Or or um what you've just bought. What was that? Tooth thing? and Claw. Yeah. Yeah, so and because Blight Wars came with some cool Nurgle mechanics in, the wheel and all that was in there. Um and a whole bunch of Nurgle models. So I reckon I reckon that is I reckon that I reckon that's how they're gonna do it. But Realm of Chaos is interesting, isn't it? To call it Realm of Chaos, Wrath and Rapture, and implies that there's a whole new thing about to happen. Yeah, but I think also some of that is to do with um, going back to the Realm of Chaos was what it used to be, wasn't it? Like, ages and ages, because yep. you've got the Slaves to Darkness. and Yep. In fact, stuff. the Slaves to Darkness was called the Realm of Chaos, wasn't it? So. Yeah. So I think that's... Um, so that's quite exciting. That's quite and, no, yeah, it is very. And beastmen are getting their own little army tome, which will kind of round off the. Apart from Slanesh, that's everything kind of out with its own list for the for the chaos, isn't it? Apart yeah, from apart maybe, from chaos dwarves. Chaos dwarves, oh yeah. I was, yeah, and marauders. Do you reckon marauders will eventually get their own thing, or do you reckon they've kind of been absorbed into the different factions? I think that they will. I think Dark Oath has got to be a thing. Yeah. I'm sure of it. Really hope they do, because I love the two Dark Oath models that they've done. Mm. The Chaos Undivided kind of thing going on. 
Yeah, and the thing is, and this leads nicely into our chat about chaos. Like in the old world, you had the Norse, and yeah. and they were like, they sort of the dark gods were just their gods. Like they didn't see the fact they were inherently evil gods. They were just the gods that they knew. Um, yeah, yeah. Yes, you can end up a bit wibbly by worshiping chaos. Um, if you throw your whole lot in with it, but it doesn't always end up that way, you know. It's just yeah, yeah. At the end, you're not likely to be a particularly nice person if you worship the chaos gods, but you aren't necessarily going to have like fifteen tentacles coming out of your backside either. <laughs> no, no. That just segue nicely onto what we were going to talk about, doesn't it? So, I mean, you've you've kind of led led out with what I was going to say in a sense, but um. We were going to talk about chaos in the old setting and chaos in the new setting. And I've always said, for me, that chaos in the old setting, I could understand it a lot more than chaos in 40k. Having said that, they've done a lot better job this time around, or over the last couple of years, of making chaos in 40k make a bit more sense. In the sense of what I'm talking about is exactly what you've just said. If you lived in the north of the old world you were next to the rift that you know the the poles where the chaos energy was literally seeping into the environment so they were your gods they if you worship them or did things that pleased them people got boons really obvious boons you know it's yeah. not like there's any subtlety about a guy who worshiped corn putting on an extra 40 kilograms of muscle and, and ending up, you know, 10 foot tall. Um, it's fairly obvious. And it's it kind of makes sense that if you lived in that area and if you were born into one of those tribes and you grew up with that culture and, and then you went off to fight and all of those things, it makes sense or made sense to me that um, that, that that's what would happen. You know, that, that would be the perpetuation of it. And you would get the old one or two cults across the empire and Bretonia or whatever, who would um, who would worship a god because you know there's always going to be people inclined to those kind of things, um, and that kind of made a whole lot of more sense. Whereas in 40k, I just did not get why a person would do it. Well, I think not to go too far talking about 40k. I think part of what I, no, I it's the comparison, it, and I think... The thing I is, think, though, life in the 41st millennium is, is rubbish. Like, really rubbish. Um, as an as an imperial citizen. Yeah. Like, when you're in all the forge work, forge hivey thingy mabobs. Quite interesting to, to look at it in the mortal realms and think, because actually a lot of the cities are quite fresh, aren't they? Yeah, they are, and and yet there's still those cults exist. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. Like, uh, is it ta- Tales from Hammerhall? Hammer? Yeah. The book, first book in there is about a Slanesh cult, and a Zinch cult, sorry. Um, and it's it made a lot more. It made this it carried on having that kind of. This is a cult, and you know they're the extreme parts of society. But I think one of the things in the Age of Sigma universe is that it's so vast. Now, mm. that and chaos has been around for such a long time that the actual environment has changed. You know, so some of the rivers have literally turned to blood because yeah. chaos energy has seeped into it. Um, yeah. There are going to be tribes of people living in those places where it makes sense <laughs> to, to carry on to worship those people because they, they, you know, you've got more of a chance of surviving. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it'll be good to do... I think that they could do an ace army with Dark Oak. Because so one of the cool things about the Mortal Realms now is... is And this is the case with all the armies. But things are being fleshed out. Um, things... You, you're seeing a lot more uh, theme in forces. So where before you had um, Warhammer Armies Chaos, Warhammer Armies Beastmen, and Warhammer Armies Demons... Yeah. What you what you're seeing now is is actually more focus on the gods. So you've got 
Magatkin of Nurgle. You've got Zinch Arcanites. You've got Blades of Corn. Um, and the, and so we're seeing some really nice models, um, dedicated to the four powers, mm. or certainly three powers at the moment. Um, with with some more to come, it seems. Uh, so I actually think it'd be really nice to see some nice models not dedicated to one of the powers, which is interesting because, you know, it wasn't that long ago that, you know, your options for your corn warriors were paint and red. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> unless, absolutely. Unless yeah. you were like well into your converting, which not everybody is. No. Um, so yeah, I think it'd be, it'd be great to see like a, Dark Oath barbaric tribe type thing. Well, they don't even necessarily need to be barbaric. They, you know, they can just be, like you said, a civilization that's gone gone with chaos as its thing. I, I think that anyone who, who believes in that kind of weird crap is going to end up a bit wrong. Well, yeah. <laughs> thing is, though, the chaos gods are like wrong. More, their power is is much easily you see it more more manifest. Although maybe not so much in the in the mortal realms because you know Sigmar sends his Stormcast Eternals, but certainly in the old world, you know Sigmar, if you were lucky, he might send you a vision in the toilet or something. But <laughs> it, 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 that was about it. You know, he didn't. It, oh, I don't know. If you're a Sigma priest, you're definitely punching yeah, but above Sigma your weight. Yeah, a Sigma priest, yeah. You, we're talking about like Joe Bloggs that works as a barman in the Ten Tail Cat, for example. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it, he doesn't need some sparkly toilet paper. What he needs is like to be attractive to the ladies, and if that means a bit of zinch or slanesh, you know, that's what he wants. Right. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, <laughs> not Nurgle. Well, it depends. You know, every <laughs> everyone needs love. <laughs> um, I think. Um, oh, what was I going to say? I could be completely through. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that idea of a of a of a guy in a, running a pub on the toilet, going to the, the loo, and the loo paper like shines bright, and it's like, "I am Sigma. <laughs> Make sure you um, wash your hands." <laughs> So uh, the where I was going with that was, do you, do you remember that excellent video for Mark of Chaos, the, the game? Yes. Um, where the Sigma priest is at the end, and he's watched yes. everyone die, and then the, the you know the bloodthirster comes out, and he gets imbued with the power of Sigma, and then knocks it out. Great, love that video. Um, that was what I was thinking of. I don't think he actually knocks it out. I think they just leap towards it. Each cuts other and then it cuts the screen, and, and then clearly, what happens next is the other he gets skin. squished. No, actually, what happens next is he's actually leaping towards him, and he drops his hammer and gives him a big hug because they're long lost brothers, and um, he's just been waiting for the call back to corn. Oh my days! That's what happened. Yeah, so I mean, one of the, moving swiftly on. What what I. I'd like to see is now is it, you're right that that move to have some more Harry the Hammer back, you know there's chaos undivided as it were, um, because I think I'd love to see this kind of tribesman back if that makes any sense. Now one of the things I did want to bring up because before we started talking I had a flick through, um, in the old in the original Slaves to Darkness book. Um, it talked about drifting castles. Oh, that's a zinch thing. Yeah, I know. And I was, oh yeah, exactly. So the drifting castle, so the sky above grew dark and the blackest storm and a cold wind blew. There was no rain, but a shower of mortar dust, yellowed leaves and tatters of flags. No storm was in the sky, but a castle much as might be found on any mortal land. Often I've imagined clouds to be Trees and fish and mountains are now a foible of some nameless and uncaring power given this fortress the guise of a cloud. I wonder if these drifting castles weren't... I, I thought I'd bring it up because I saw it before we started talking and I thought it was cool. Uh, weren't the inspiration for the Silver Towers, which would be really, really cool because it you know, gives that indication that they've gone right the way back to the books. 
the first books and they're pulling things out to to drag into the current ones yeah absolutely and because the thing is you've got to remember like you can obviously writing takes time but you can write ideas and have ideas and scribbles and sketch stuff down you know far quicker than you can do the whole production thing on the miniatures can't you yeah and now this is so this is the because we've said a couple of times, haven't we? Like it's it's almost overwhelming how much stuff is coming. Yep. But on the plus side, this kind of capacity to capacity to create, you know, anything is possible. Anything yeah. is possible. You know, we've had a squat come back. They're doing Sisters of Battle. You know, yeah. I've got a Warlord Titan, and I could have one in forty k if I had the money. <laughs> And the desire to build such a monster. You know? There's so yeah. many great things. Lord of the Rings is being relaunched. You know? The, the game that, for many, was thought lost. You know? is being relaunched properly with a box set and all. You know? It's it's awesome, dude. It's so cool. Gene Stealer Cults. Back. We got rogue traders now, so yeah. <laughs> I don't even know how I've ended up going down this route. What were you talking no. about? Oh, we were talking about castles. We were talking about the part stuff coming from the past. Yeah, so mm. loads of stuff can be be drawn upon, can't it? Yeah, yeah, which is absolutely. good. So, um, on that note, um, <laughs> should we move across into the community, fella? We probably should, because if I just decide to list everything that has come out that's excited me, we could be here for some time. Yes, we could. Fairness? Excellent. Off we go, then. Ta-ta! Hail to our mighty community. So it's that time uh, where I pick some people whose stuff I think is cool. Ben picks some people whose stuff he thinks is cool. And then Ben does all the work of telling <laughs> you all what amazing uh, activities and fun things are going on. Um, so there we are. So, Ben, shout outs for this week's community section. I said weeks again. Like, that's twice now. That is not any kind of indication that we are thinking of going weekly. I just want to put that out there. Because we genuinely <laughs> aren't. <laughs> no. no. Right. Um, so the first one I'd like to shout out is a chap called Mike Ingram. He's um, around all over the place, but I mostly follow him on Instagram um, as at Mezgeik, M-E-Z-G-I-K-E. Um, and this you're going to laugh at me for this, Dan, but... His his Nurgle are just phenomenal. Um, well, you just sent me a picture, and I said, "Please tell me there's an LED in that." Yeah, it, this this. And you were like, "No." The style <laughs> is is incredible. It's um, so essentially, it's really dark. It's kind of, I suppose, Black Legion esque, and then the tentacles and the plasma glow is done in a ferociously bright green. Um, but it's a real pale light. It genuinely looks like it's generating its own light. Um, it's very, very impressive, and um, and I absolutely love them. And I saw them when um, that he was first doing them when the Dark Imperium box set came out. Um, and I've recently been sort of plotting how to do my Nurgle half of the Dark Imperium box set. Um, to finish that box set off, so I've been been going back and having a look, and um, there's even more awesome stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous, really. Um, <laughs> so yeah, he's definitely worth a follow if you if you're interested in in Nurgle um, or or just painting stuff in a really unique way. Because I mean, essentially, his color palette is black and and bright green um, and some sort of neutral colors in between, uh, and it it just looks phenomenal, really. So there's stuff to take out of that, even if you're even if you're not interested in painting Nurgle. Um, my second one is, is quite a famous chap called Oliver Spaeth. Um, S-P-A-E-T-H. He's on, um, 
Instagram and he has his own Patreon and he does excellent, um, bass and classes, which, um, one of our, one of our mates has been to and couldn't speak highly enough of it. Um, and he also sells bass and kits as well, has all the Govins. Cause one of the things I find when I'm looking at people's stuff is like, well, where did you get that from? Cause you, you haven't made it. You bought that from somewhere. Um, and he, he does these kits together. He, the realism of his stuff is, is just unbelievable. Um, <laughs> you know, if some of the stuff that he's posted when he's been zoomed in, I have to double take to, to know it's not a picture of a forest. It's that good. So, um, yeah. Yeah. If you're not, if you haven't checked him out on Instagram or wherever, um, I, you know, he's, I, I would because, um, there's a lot to learn just from looking at his stuff, really. Um, and trying to work out how he's done it. Um, you know, if not actually having to go and look on his Patreon and see what, you know, some of his tutorials, because, um, I probably will be. Um, because I think basing is something that we both love and getting that super realistic, natural looking base for me is like the holy grail of modeling. Um, so yeah, there's my two. Ace. I could well, do um, so many more, but I, I've been, I know been restricted loads, to two. <laughs> most of my day, most of my messenger feed is you posting me links to Instagram, which is brilliant. Look at this <laughs> awesome <laughs> thing! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, although weirdly, and this is my techno idiocy really coming across, when I click on the link, it takes me to Instagram, but I'm not logged in. Oh yeah, no. Um, as the yeah. two P's to then comment. And I'm always like, oh, but I don't know my login because it's automatic. Yeah. Um, so yeah. But there we are. That's why I leave the comment in to you. And, um. Oh, that's the moving reason, on. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, uh, I always like to have a quick flick through the two P's, um, hobby group. I uh, really, really appreciate everybody that's in there. And, um, people posting, but also people commenting as well, because, uh, people put a lot of hard work in. And I think, um, if you are scrolling and you see something you like, always look, just take the time to like it. And if you can take the time to comment, um, because, uh, that kind of inspires people. I know I love it. Um, if I put my stuff up. So, uh, Nick Johnson's been doing some screamers, dude. The blue is so vibrant. I just love it. It's just the right blue for screamers. Um, they're not crazy, like they're not like all loads of colours and things, so they're quite classic in that way. And I really like them. Um, I didn't spend too long looking at them because I don't need any more encouragement to do any more chaos things. Um, <laughs> a whole new faction of chaos. Focused. Yes, exactly, exactly. So, and I've got, I have got silver tower to paint, um, as well. So, uh, it would be easy for me to fall to, to Zeech's trickery. Um, but no, I shall hold on to my chain axe. And, um, James Cheese writes working on Titanicus, as I'm sure many people are. So he put his, uh, rather awesome warlord up recently. Um, but he's been working on some knights, seeing some ace stuff on those little knights. I think people are really enjoying painting those little knights. Well, his, his knights, uh, I, I, like I said in a comment that I know a knight has been painted well, um, when I have to double take to make sure it's not a 40k one. Yeah. And, and yeah. I did with his, genuinely did. Um, so, yeah. you know, tip of the hat to you, mate. Yeah, really good. Uh, and we can't, we can't go through a shout outs without, um, mentioning, uh, Ian's amazing, Ian Cray's amazing Sisters of Battle, um, conversions that he's using as a kill team. Um, they're incredible. Just incredible. And such a nice, reimagining of how sisters of battle should look even to the point where i was looking at them today and i was thinking actually maybe games workshop you know should have done them like this yes because <laughs> they look amazing yeah yeah um they look really good i, th- I obviously um i don't even know what i was going to say then oh obviously built off like a storm cast basis the secretors yeah um, yeah, so re- really good, really worth checking out. And I must say, really appreciate people posting in there. Um, really, really good. Um, Ben, 
Calendar. Calendar? Ooh. What's going on? Ought to bring that bad boy up. Okay, so what day is it today? 3rd of September or something like that. So It is the 3rd. It's been a bit of a Blood Bowl weekend, if um, if you got involved. So there's been the Bearded Cup, full Bearded Cup, um, up at Warhammer World. Um, and um, that's meant to be a right old laugh. So I've got to go to one of those one day. I get absolutely creamed. I'm so bad at Blood Bowl. Yeah, so, but it's so not bad. really about that, is it? It's more about the... Um... The taking part <laughs> and the enjoyment. <laughs> yeah. so, That's what I tell myself. So, um, unfortunately, today, which is the release day on Wednesday, um, so we slightly missed calling this one out, but um, The Secrets of the Elements um, is the card game at L5R Tournament at Barb's Model and Games. Tomorrow, um, uh, we have... Um, I've started to put the Firestorm ones on here, dude, because that's right next to you, isn't it? I didn't realise that, but... Um, just over the bridge. So they've got an X Wings event on Thursday this week. Um, so it's tomorrow. Um, at Firestorm in Cardiff. And then, um, on the Friday, Star Wars Destiny event too. Over the weekend, up in Warhammer World, the, uh, Invasion of Lenar 4, um, is a 40k, uh, sorry, Horus Heresy campaign weekend, which sounds awesome. I was reading that and Pretty disappointed I hadn't booked myself in for it. Um, and close to the home is Curtonian Carnage 2 40k tournament um, with the absolute gents up in Curtain Games. And um, that's running on the Saturday. Um, yeah, Saturday the 8th. Uh, and on the Sunday, up at Big is a Kill Team campaign day, which I really love the sound of, actually, dude. Um, so it's quite like seeing these little kill team events popping up because I reckon you could get quite a lot of games in on the day. Yeah. Well, I'm going to shout out um, something off the top of my head, which is amazing. Um, I am going, so, you know, celebrity endorsement to... <laughs> <laughs> to Bix. A big... Jim has arranged to have a bit of a meet-up on Wednesday evening um, down at Big Half Five for people looking to play um the Middle Earth strategy battle game. Now that that is out, um, I think the idea is we're going to do a bit of battle companies first. A few of us have got the book, and it's a great way to get started. So, um, yeah, if you if you are listening to this and it comes out usually about half five, doesn't it? And you suddenly think, my goodness, I just have to see one of the famous peas, um, or play some Lord of the Rings and come down. Excellent. There you go. Um, and is that going to run every Wednesday, dude? No, I don't think so. I think that's just an initial one. But there is, there is, um, there is a group, a Facebook group, which um, I did a post about just recently, um, and you can find either through Bristol Independent Gaming, and I'm sure. I will find some time to post up about it again. Uh, but it's basically, if you are in Bristol and you're looking for games, and I think these groups are really ace because especially something like Lord of the Rings, I think a lot of hobbyists have got some Lord of the Rings but haven't looked at it for a long time. Um, and I think it's going to be really important to have these groups so that people uh, have got somewhere they can go and get back into the game yeah, um, yeah. and find people that are into the game. Now, I'm on a massive, like, buzz for, for Lord of the Rings at the moment so I would say that but I was really pleased to see Jim put up, put up the group yeah yeah. so um, we spoke about it last time um, the next Thursday the X-Wing 2 release night at uh, Curtain Games oh yes you could go to that on the way back down yeah I could do actually I could do um, when is actually X-Wing 2 being released is it that night? I have no idea. I don't follow it because I just don't need that financial drain. Are you looking it up now? I am. Sorry, I've gone quiet. Phil, Dan, Phil. That's all right. I'm going to fill. Um, it's got to be re- you know, close to that. 
Do, 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 do. It must be that night, to be honest. Anyway, that, that do, makes do, sense. Do, do, do. I haven't finished my song. Oh, sorry. Okay, so um, 15th of September is um, got is literally jam-packed. Um, five events on that day. So Warhammer 40k Grand Tournament, um, Heat 2 at Warhammer World, um, Star Wars Legion Ground Assault at Firestorm Games Cardiff, the Bolt Action Welsh Open um, is also running at um, Firestorm in Cardiff. Uh, it's a Kings of War tournament, if you're interested in that, at Bristol Independent Gaming. Um, Curtain Cup 6, the Road to X-Bowl. There's a Blood Bowl tournament at Curtain. Um, and the Colours 2018, where Outlands will be running, the Outlands chaps will be running intro games there, so that's um, worth popping over if you're near Newbury. Um, and then on the 16th, we have Warhammer 2nd Edition Tournament at Bristol Independent Gaming. Um, that's Sunday the 16th of September. Um, and then push. Ah, yes. And there is a teddy bears picnic at the Avon Valley Railway. Oh, excellent. That's, that's, yeah. I picnic. just thought I'd throw that out there because that's why I'm not going to the Age of Sigma tournament. Um, and then following weekend, Saturday the 22nd, is the War, uh, Warhammer World's 40k Kill Team Weekender, which looks awesome. And, um, I do know that would be bloody ace, wouldn't it? Yeah. Because it would be quick games. You could not, you could play a lot of games, but also you could get plenty of time in the bar. And meeting loads of um, people as well. Eating chips and meeting lots of people, yeah. Um, and then Barb's is running an Age of Sigma tournament on that day too. Uh, which is cool. That's down in um, Red Ruth. And then Hard Pounding, which is <laughs> a Peninsula Wars historical game uh, event uh, a Bristol Independent Gaming. That's on Saturday the 22nd too. And then finally, just around that weekend off, Star Wars Armada um, Season 2 uh, at Firestorm Games in Cardiff. So there we go. A lot's going on. I think I'd quite like to go to that um, Peninsula War game thing. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Would be quite cool, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, guys, there's only one last thing to cover before we round this section off. Is um, we are running, and it's been running for a week and a bit now. Um, a competition to turn a Age of Sigma Stormcast non-character infantryman. The only character that we are allowing is the um the one on the front of the Getting Started magazine. And the Knight and Cantor. And um to turn that into either a Chaos Warrior or a forty K Chaos Space Marine. And um and paint him up and enter him in, and there will be a little prize. Um which I haven't decided yet. We haven't decided yet, but it and um that will be will gather the basically the deadline is the release date of the next podcast. So we won't be announcing it on, on the podcast, but we will have all of the entries or most of the entries to have a look at them and have a, you know, a bit of a buzz about. Uh, and then we will announce that on the, on the pages. There's some wonderful ones. So. There has, and we've had quite a lot of entries actually. So, um, and there are some really great ones. So we're going to be whittling it down to five entries and then the community. You guys will be picking the the, the winner. Um, so look, good luck, and we we look forward to seeing more because um, some of them have been really pretty special, actually. <laughs> to be honest, yeah, um, you could, yeah, yeah. Alrighty, so um, thanks, guys, and we'll we're going to head over to the wilds now, which is a dark and scary place. Hello, hello, and we are in the wilds, where we're going to talk about all of the other shizzle that interests us, that we can't squeeze into one of the other sections, really. Um, and we're going to have no trouble filling it this time. We've got uh, Lord of the Rings for Dan, and I've been looking at Test of Honour. So who, do you want to go first, Dan? Because I think you're so excited, I don't know if I could restrain you. <laughs> I'll just interrupt. 
if I don't. <laughs> you just into, yeah, I get halfway through the first sentence, but yeah, but I'm not interested. Lord of the Rings. <laughs> so one of the one of the really cool things uh, about Lord of the Rings is in this month's White Dwarf, the temporal distal article is upside down. Um, in a homage to, do you remember when White Dwarf you used to turn it over and the yeah. and that section was upside down at the back of the Lord of the Rings? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I loved that. I loved looking at it. I can remember. Um, and I put this on a post. I can remember being at Games Day in the NEC. Uh, no, not the NEC, sorry, the NIA um, in Birmingham when they put up pictures of the first box set, the the one with the goblins and the elves and the men of Numenor in it, in the yeah. green box. Yeah. And I can remember being sat at my table at home before school. Uh, and this shows it was a while ago because the postmen don't get out on the road now until after children have gone to school um and the and it turned up in the post i can remember it vividly and it was so exciting um and i can feel that excitement again um, which is odd because like the game's not been gone but to see it with a starter set and oh man i've gone mental mate i finished listening to the audio book for fellowship of the ring which was fantastic i'm now listening to the two towers Harry and I have watched over two nights the first disc of the extended edition Fellowship of the Ring. Um, I just love it. I'm loving it. I'm loving the models. So the new game, um, it's got some really cool stuff in it. I really like Heroic Tears. So I don't know how much you know about Lord of the Rings, where it was before this came out. But essentially armies are all comprised of warbands. Um, so you have a, in your warband, you have a hero and a number of followers, um, which previously was, uh, I think 12. Uh, and then you have loads of those make up an army. So you need like captains and stuff like that. Um, but in the new game, different heroes have heroic tiers, which allows them to lead more or less people. Yeah, so yeah. Heroes of Legend, for example, can lead up to 18 followers, which is the highest tier. And then you get heroes um, or independent heroes, I, I can't quite remember the name, who can't lead anyone. Or they just form a little warband on their own. Um, so an example of that is like Meriadoc is... Um, oh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, a, he's just a hero on his own, so he can't lead a warband. Um, but... Um, Interestingly, I wonder, I'd have to flick through and see what he's like in, he might have another, I think that's the version of him, Hero of the Riddermark, I think there's another version of him for in the Shire. Yeah. Um, and then like, I say, Theoden, the Hero Legend, Witch King, Hero Legend, um, and they can have like much bigger warbands, so I really like that, I think that's really good. And one thing that's really good about the rule book, and it's really strange man, because I've I've not read a rule book cover to cover for a very long time. Um, I usually pick out a couple of key changes and then play the game. And as I play the game, I sort of learn the updates. Um, with this one, I am reading every section because it's a good refresher anyway, because it's been a long time um, since I, I looked at the Lord of the Rings rules in detail. Uh, but one thing that's great is examples. Examples are really clear. And it's really clearly noted which box, which picture you've got to look at to have an example of the thing that you're currently reading about. Mm. And that struck me as being being excellent. Um, So I thought that was very well laid out. Um, I've not got miles through. I've just got, I've just, I think I'm just about to read Courage Tests. I skipped forward to look at Cavalry because I was building my wags and I wanted to know whether there was a need to build a couple unmounted. And the, what I was going to say ages back in the hobby desk was that uh, because of this warbands size restriction, um, I don't want, I say I don't want, it doesn't really matter if I have a couple less wags because it just helps things fit into the army list. Um, uh, what else was I? Oh, and the scenarios. So we touched on this. Um, but the classics are in there. So, um, and I love that they 
list participants because it's such a cool thing to collect towards. Yeah, like an is, actual yeah. list of participants. Yeah. So, or or that you would have in that scenario. Clearly, it's not all of the participants because the last alliance had more than seventy two orcs take part. Um, but yeah, so the last alliance, which is what you and I have said about um, playing in November, um, if possible, has got the, the actual listed participants. I think I've got. Um, it's 72 orcs, four captains with sword and shield, Sauron, and two trolls, I think, on my side. Um, and Sauron is, is understandably a monster. <laughs> he, yeah. Rules-wise, he's always been a bit ridiculous, but... Yeah, but he, he was anyway. He's meant he? to be, yeah. Um, um, so my one was a bit frustrating because I've got more elves than I could possibly show fit on the regular battlefield. Um, to be honest, though, it doesn't really matter. It is just it would be cool to do it with the. It's nothing compared to Pelinor. The amount of bits you need for Pelinor, <laughs> loads of stuff. But that's that's all to come. I was actually talking to Chris Goff about um, working together to collect. The whole lot, every scenario. Oh um, yeah. yeah, with all the do the terrain and have the forces and all of it. Be ace. Be really ace. It would be really cool. Um, it's one of those things where I I don't. I I'd I'd like to collect bits of everything so that when people came round, you'd have those scenarios out, you know ready to go. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. Hundred percent agree. It seems yeah, you know, I, I genuinely look through all of the all of the chaos, all the chaos, all of the evil stuff, and think, oh yeah, I don't, I'd like to have a bit of that, a bit of that. Um, oh, obviously, I'd like cool. to do all the good sides first, but um... <laughs> so I'd really like to go back over over time, and, and and clearly, I would end up paying above the odds for some of these miniatures, but but start collecting up all of the. The iconic characters, yeah, um, Tom Bombadil, Goldberry, yeah. You know, I'd love to get that. Get the iconic box sets, even. I I think you might find that a lot of those see the light of day again, dude. If it does well, even if they're just re-released in fine cast or or you know metal, I think. It, um, yeah, I hope so. I mean, I've got the original Fellowship, so I'll, I'll paint them up. Um. And then go from there, really. Yeah, awesome. So I, I'm, I'm, I've buckled. I was only going to get the rule book, uh, but I got Pelennor Fields. Well, you did it in a legendary way. I haven't. I'm super excited, and I haven't got Pelennor Fields yet because um, I made a deal with uh, Ben Chambers that I wouldn't get it, or we wouldn't get it until Titanicus comes out. And then he messaged me. And he said, I really want to do Rohan, but we haven't done Titanicus. To which I replied, maybe our rules should only apply within game system. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, But that didn't work. Yeah. I've got to get on and do the Titanicus stuff. Yeah, I mean, essentially what I was looking at is I'm going to get the rules. Like I said, I wanted to collect bits of both armies. So the stuff in the box set was all valid for me. Um, so I figured I'd get the box set and just... Because I, I'm going to do Space Wolves next, and then I'm going to really focus on getting Lord of the Rings, well, Titanicus next, sorry, then a few Space Wolves, um, and then really sit down and focus on Lord of the Rings and get loads of that stuff done. Um, so it's there in the bag, ready to go. Yeah, and the thing is, over buying the sets separately, um, it is very good value. It is, yeah. Excellent value. I think the um the evil side for example so you get 36 Morana Norks, which you can't buy sets of 36 you buy them in 24s now um but so that would be um 3750 and then um the witch king is 3750 um so what's that 75 and then the troll is twenty five, 
So that's a hundred pound into sets, individual sets. Just that's for before the evil you've even got off the floor. Yeah. That's the evil side. The rule book's thirty five. And then um the good side is uh thirty six pounds for the cavalry. Say so you couldn't buy twelve men of Rohan, but if you take half the price is twelve pound fifty, so that's thirty eight fifty. Um what have you got? Is Men of the Dead in there, isn't there? Yeah. I don't know how many, but it's probably twenty five pounds worth. Um You know, so so you're up in the sort of eighties, because they are them we don't know the price for. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you you, you know, individual kits wise, you say over two hundred pound. Yeah. Yeah. Which is so, what what convinced me, to be honest. Yeah, 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 I'm not helping myself resist here. No, and I got I got yeah. So, um, moving on because we don't want to take forever doing this section. Either. Um, uh, I was having a chat with John, uh, Outlands John, and um, from Shades of Chaos Games, and we were we were really looking at doing a historical game, and because um, it was something we're both interested in. I'm interested in history anyway. Um, and he he's not, but wanted to use a historical game to get into history, if that makes any sense. And um, we went through the whole lot, looking at things, all of them, pros and cons for all of them, um, and then settled on Test of Honor, which is a feudal Japanese um, skirmish game i suppose is the best way to describe it so it's uh it's very low model count which is one of the things that i was certainly looking for we got put off the peninsula war by the vast numbers of models you needed to make it any decent um and we wanted a game that was in scale with some so we didn't have to double up on scenery as well mate yeah um and um so it's 15 to five, sorry 5 to 20 models on each side and um the box set is starting box set is 40 quid and has everything you need, a whole like a, a set RB done. Um, and if you wanted to collect more, then it would be swapping out units from that army. Basically, you know, you, you would, um, you couldn't make the army any bigger, if that is what I'm getting at. Right. Um, I'm dead excited about it because I, I love samurai history. Um, because I've done, Aido before I've done karate for donkey's years, um, and Akira Kurosawa films. I literally went through university living on those films, so um, I'm really excited to get my hands on some of the models and uh, uh, and the scenery. To be honest, and um, I'm, I'm picking up my box set on Monday, and um, well, this coming. I won't get to me. I shouldn't think until Friday, but. Um, I'm really excited about it. Um, so watch this space. I yeah, well, I, to be honest, I'm surprised in a way how long it's taken for you to get into doing a historical game. But then I suppose in another way I'm not surprised because there's so much cool stuff, isn't there? Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, there's a lot. Um, I also do Saga a little bit. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but I, it's just time to paint them, really. And you know, twenty person model count. I really ought to do my saga wall band and just bosh that out. Um, but I, I'm just really excited looking through all the models. Like, you know, really, really sitting down and painting a, um, you know, painting the samurai because I think I think they are their armor is beautiful, basically, and I, I can't wait to do it. So, dead excited. Really am. So there we go. That's my little bit on Test of Honor. I know nothing more than that. John's played it, loved it, so I'm trusting him. I figure if he writes games, he should know which ones are bad and not. So uh, <laughs> You would hope. <laughs> oh, yeah, you would hope so. Um, if he's wrong, then I will mock him endlessly. Um, yes. But really, you don't want to get in I've mocking. heard good things about it, and I've seen it. Um, it's on sale. The big have got it in. Mm. Um, I've even got some scenery suitable for it randomly, but oh, cool. I've I've got plenty of things to focus on for now. Yeah, so there we go. 
that's that. Cool. I think we've we've come to the end, haven't we? We have. We've bimbled our way across the finish line. Yeah. Puffing and the, panting. Puffing, panting, <laughs> falling asleep, yawning. Um. So as normal, find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, YouTube especially Ben. Ben's face on YouTube. Um, I'll get there eventually. <laughs> just to you know, prop up the uh, the ratio of uh, of hair to visible face. And I'll just <laughs> change it a bit around. Um, get involved with the competition. We've got uh, the the group as well. If you if you're doing some cool hobby, we'd love to see that in the group. That'd be really cool. Um, and also do check out the website um, two peas in a pod dot com. Under community, particularly, Ben's put a lot of time into not just putting up events, but also listing gaming clubs. Um, Marcus, I'm gonna gonna call you out here. Marcus, a good friend of ours, was looking for somewhere to play, um, and uh, we pointed out that that resource was on there, uh, and he'd not looked at it, despite you know. Oh, it reminds me, I need to all. slap him for that. Yeah, absolutely, take him down. So. Uh, but and while you're at it, hit him with the other hand for playing Dark Angels. Do that. <laughs> so. Yeah, so um, we're in a number of places lurking around. Um, we try and share as much community stuff as we can. Um, it's all just about community um, and showing stuff off. And we love it when you guys interact and what have you uh, when the opportunity arises. So, yeah. Cool. Ben, as ever, great to chat to you. You too, buddy. Um, not too much mindless going on about the space. To be honest, I need to do something cornate, really. It's been a good no. few episodes, really, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I know. Since... I've been enjoying it. Oh. It was for week after week was, oh, I painted something corn red. And oh, it's got blood in the title. And oh, I'll kill things. Oh. Ace. Well, I'm glad you <laughs> find my uh, hobby conversation so engaging. And... Um... <laughs> It's all right, mate. I've got plenty to do for Mordor. Then I've got to do some Titan Legion. Um, then I want to do Cordor. So we're a, a good way off uh, getting back to some corn. Of course, if Games Workshop drop the corn bomb and there's loads of stuff, well, it's all going out the window, isn't it? So. <laughs> right then, my friend. Until next time. Thank you, listeners. Bye-bye. Bye.